All right, this will be chapter six, viruses. <clears throat> Uh, we've mentioned before that uh, Pastor uh, worked on vaccines. He actually uh, came up with the first vaccine for rabies, um, identified it as something other than a bacteria because it was too small. Uh, there's a story um, that uh, he had been uh, demonstrating the ability to uh, vac vaccinate animals and a because virus, because if you get rabies, it's deadly. And there was a mother whose son had been attacked by a wolf, a rabid wolf. So he had rabies, <clears throat> or he had the, the, he had been infected with rabies. And she came to him begging for him to try vaccinating his, her son. And he was uh, reluctant at first because he wasn't sure if it would work on a human. And if it did work, if it didn't work, then it would set back a lot of his practice. But he, he did go ahead and do it. And the, uh, the boy was saved. And the rumor is that 60 years later, uh, in the, the fall of Paris, the Nazis were going into the uh, Pasteur Institute and they were going to ransack it or something. And this boy, who's now an old man, stood guard at the Pasteur's grave or something along that side, uh, wouldn't let him come in. That's the rumor. Since Pastor saved his life, he was saving Pastor's remembrance. There's the story for you. All right. Ivanovsky and Bayernik uh, showed the disease, uh, a disease in tobacco plants was caused by a virus. Uh, shortly afterwards, this was the, they, these two gentlemen did a lot with it. Uh, <clears throat> viruses were too small for us to see until the 1950s, whenever we were able to uh, see them with an electron microscope. Uh, before then, we could test form using chemicals, uh, look at their reactions. We could see the effects of viruses, but we can never actually see a virus because they were too small to be seen. In the 1950s, we were able to see the size, the shape, and a little bit more of the composition of them. All right, <clears throat> there's no universal agreement on how they are started. Um, there's a subset that uh, believes that the viruses were uh, pre-life that they were around before bacteria were around and uh, but uh, most or the majority of people do believe <clears throat> think that uh, viruses are a retro evolution that they were uh, parasitic bacteria and they kind of lost some of their abilities and they just uh, so they just became strictly uh, a nucleic acid and a protein coat um, well, they're, they're pretty su uh, successful, however they came to be, because there's more viruses there is than there is anything else. It really doesn't matter which way they, uh, um, how they originated, that it's just that they did originate, and no one will ever be able to prove it anyway, which one way or the other. But again, they are the most abundant microbe on Earth, uh, and they do play a major role in evolution because they transfer genes from species to species, humans ourselves we are i believe it's like 10 percent of our genome is viral genome <clears throat> so they played a part in even our evolution this bottom line right down here though is a very important thing all viruses are obligate intracellular species that means they have to be inside of a cell or excuse me person inside of a cell to function. If they're outside of a cell, they don't do anything. It's just a piece of nucleic acid and some protein sitting there doing absolutely nothing. They can't replicate, do anything. They have to get inside of a cell before they can cause any problems. <clears throat> Your textbook, uh, chapter six at table one, the, this table here gives you a really good rendition of characteristics of uh, viruses. Again, Everything has a virus. There is even viruses for some viruses, but bacteria, paras um, protozoa, algae, plants, animals, everything. There are viruses for them. They're really tiny. They are acellular. There, there's no cell on them, so we don't consider them to alive. Again, it's a semantic thing. There's some people that say they should be considered alive, but it doesn't really matter. The characteristics are still going to be there. <clears throat> 
I mean, like I said, they're inactive outside of the hose. Um, they have either DNA or RNA, not both. All living organisms that we know of have both RNA and DNA, and these are only one or the other. Now, DNA is normally double-stranded, but they can have single-stranded RNA, or DNA. The RNA is normally single-stranded. They can have double-stranded RNA. <clears throat> so it's, they're kind of, they're pretty diverse in that aspect. Uh, they lack enzymes for most the metabolic functions. In other words, that means they cannot perform most chemical reactions for life, which is another reason why we say they can't be alive. Uh, they can't replicate themselves. They have to be inside of a cell, and then they use the, the cell's machinery to replicate and make more of them. Otherwise, you're just going to have one, and it's just going to be sitting there doing nothing. <clears throat> so those are some of the uh, aspects for them. Uh, characteristics of uh, viruses, whether we consider them to be alive or not alive. Uh, kind of familiarize yourself with that chart. It'll, it'll help you with this the upcoming test for this one, this unit. Comparative sizes. Uh, the white one is uh, a yeast cell, or the, me, the blue one is a yeast, and uh, here's a bacteria, and here's some small bacteria. Some of the largest viruses are about are the size of bacteria, some of the smallest bacteria. But most, bac most viruses are really tiny. Uh, right here, this is an influenza bacteria, pretty, or virus, excuse me, pretty tiny. Uh, there's rabies, pretty tiny. Uh, HIV right there is pretty tiny also. <clears throat> all right, the structure, they do not look like cells, all right? Again, they lack the protein synthesizing machinery, but they do contain the parts they need to invade and control the host. <clears throat> And then we have the viral particle. You have the outer covering and the central core. The outer covering has a capsid. Some of them will have an envelope, some of them will not. In the central core, you're going to have a nucleic acid. Notice it's DNA or RNA. <clears throat> and some will have a matrix protein in there, but not all do. So there's the capsids. All viruses have a capsid. They can be different shapes, but all viruses have a capsid. And it's a protein coat that uh, surrounds the nucleic acid and protects it. <clears throat> together, if you uh, call the capsid and the nucleic acid, and together we call them a nucleocapsid, uh, and that's fine. <clears throat> Some viruses, as you see on this bottom picture, have an envelope around them. The envelope is um, usually part of a cell membrane that it takes with it. So this would be an enveloped uh, virus. This one up here without an envelope, we would call it a naked virus. Now these, the capsids themselves are made up of tiny proteins. And the tiny proteins that make up the capsids are called capsomers. So capsomers make up pro, um, the capsids and the capsids cover the uh, nucleic acid in, uh, of the protein, or the virus, excuse me. <clears throat> so we have two types. We have an helical, which is continuous. Again, there's a little capsid. Each one of these little beads is a capsid, and they spiral around, and this makes the capsum, or, excuse me, yeah, the capsum or the capsid, excuse me, that protects the nucleic acid inside of it. This is a helical one. Uh, they're long filamentous like. Another one is a icosahedral. These are 12 sided objects. Uh, <clears throat> they have, uh, if you look at this picture right here, there's pentagons at the corners. And inside these corners, the, if, you, uh, if we were in class, uh, have models and you could see that there is a hexagon inside of the, in between these corners. You can see they're all relatively the same if they're not associated. But again, there's 20 sides to these things. <clears throat> the envelope, again, these are mainly animal viruses that have them. So for our purposes, we're going to say if it has an envelope, it's definitely an animal virus. Uh, again, they pick it up when they leave the cell because they're, pick, they're taking part of that cell membrane with it. Uh, they have some exposed uh, spikes on them. This particular one again we're looking at is a um, an influenza virus. <clears throat> and it's these spikes that uh, enable the um, virus to attach to a cell and get inside of it. 
if you've been watching the news with the uh, coronavirus, those red spots they show on them, those are the spikes on the coronavirus, on the on COVID-19 that they use to get into a cell. Uh, even though this one is round, if you look inside here where the genome is, the nucleic acids, this is actually a helical uh, capsid with a membrane around it. Okay, so this is an enveloped one. Over here is an, another helical uh, virus that does not have a membrane. So this one here is a naked virus. This one, <clears throat> again, is an enveloped virus with a helical uh, capsid. All right, the capsids and the envelopes. And again, there's that pent or the Pentagon right there. And if you look inside here, there's six of them. I'm just telling you about that. So there's your uh, icosahedral. Uh, the capsids and the envelopes, these are to protect them when they're not inside of a cell. All right. Uh, so not only is it protecting that, but again, it enables it to adhere to, the, bind to the surface, stick to the surface, and get inside of the host so that it can release its own DNA or RNA, depending on what type of virus it is, into the cell and take over the machinery of the cell. So we went over the icosahedral and helical ones, and then we have some complex ones. Uh, these the ones you're looking at right here are primarily uh, phages or bacteriophages, and in fact, virus, excuse me, in fact, bacteria. Though like a pox virus, uh, it doesn't have a typical capsid, so it's considered a complex virus or atypical, and it does infect humans. Um, many of them have a polyhedral head, again, the, the capsid head. It's got the nucleic acid on the inside. There's a sheath here. They have uh, These things have tail fibers for uh, attaching to the cell, and they kind of act like a hypodermic needle. They'll attach to the cell. And then with a, a phage, they inject the genome inside the cell. The uh, capsid and all this stuff, the proteins do not enter the cell. So they're a little different, <clears throat> kind of alien looking thing. Uh, again, types of viruses. Here's some complex ones, some enveloped ones, uh, naked ones. And they give you some examples of them here. Again, pox viruses up here. There's rabies right here. Um, uh, where is it at? Uh, HIV is this one, I believe. Yes. Uh, over here is your tobacco mosaic. Oh, excuse me, plum virus, pox virus, excuse me. It looks like a tobacco mosaic. How would you describe this virus? Well, it's long and thin, and I don't see any uh, envelope around it. So we know it is not, it's naked. Uh, it's not complex, it's not helical, so, excuse me, not icosahedral, so this one will be helical. The viral genome, again, either DNA or RNA, never both, okay? And it only carries the necessary genes to invade the cell. Uh, so in theory, it would only need three, but I think the smallest number is like four. Uh, compare that to a bacteria, to let's say E. coli, which has about 2,000 genes. Um, compare that to a human, which has some 20,000 genes, I believe it is. <clears throat> Again, the genes vary for each type. Influenza has eight genes, okay? Uh, Ebola has seven genes, so they, they vary. And so the number of eight genes does not have anything to do with the vir uh, virulence of it. All right, so types of the nucleic acids. We can break it down into DNA or RNA. Then DNA, they're usually double-stranded because that's how we normally find DNA, but it can be single-stranded. All right, so then it'd be classified as a double-stranded DNA virus or single-stranded DNA virus. Um, in eukaryotes, the DNA is linear, pro excuse me, prokaryotes, it's circular. Viruses, it can be one or the other. For the uh, RNA, again, RNA is usually single-stranded, but it can be double-stranded, and it can even be broken into different pieces. Um, influenza is a virus that has, I told you, had eight genes, and they're broken into eight different pieces, which is part of the reason why it mutates so much. <clears throat> Uh, so there's some characteristics for you there. Uh, and now these 
the RNA segments can be either positive or negative sense also. Uh, positive sense means that it's ready to be copied and made into a gene. Uh, negative sense means you've got to copy it but go backwards with it. So you got to make it into DNA, then make a positive RNA out of it, and then you can make a gene out of it. And so it's a little different. Or, excuse me, it's got to be written backwards. But anyway, you've got to copy it into another one before it can be made into a positive RNA and then made into a, a protein. Some viruses have some proteins with them, or excuse me, uh, enzymes with them. Most do not. Um, some of them will have polymerases. Uh, if they're building, if it's a DNA one, it's going to have DNA polymerase. If it's an RNA, it'll have RNA polymerase. And these are the ones that just build DNA or RNA. You have replicases, which copy RNA. And you can have reverse transcriptase, because uh, there's a, um, and these make the DNA from the uh, RNA. And we have a few of uh, a few of these. HIV is one of them. Uh, human T lymphocyte virus is another one. We don't know too many retroviruses, uh, but those are some examples of things that they have. All right, how do we classify them? Their structure, you know, the shape of the uh, capsid, whether they have an envelope or not, um, RNA, DNA, double strand, single strand, positive, negative, and their chemical makeup, and we can look at their genes to identify them also. Uh, there's several orders and families and genera. We don't normally go down to a species because they're not really living things. So we don't go down to the species. All families will end in name Viridae. You'll see that whenever you do your uh, virus quizzes. Genus names end up in the, with virus on them. So then they give you the example on this particular one is the uh, excuse me, herpes simplex virus one, abbreviated HSV1. This is the, the uh, virus that causes cold sores. And there's a list of um, viruses in your textbook. Uh, we use some of those. We give you some different ones also that you might come in contact with in various situations. How do viruses multiply? All right, now we're going to start off with animal viruses on this one first. And here's the steps for them. Six steps, depending on your textbook, ours is giving you six, is the absorption. Absorption is really just, it's attaching to the cell. Now it gets inside of the cell, so that's the penetration portion. Then it has to... Because uh, animal cells, the capsid will get inside of the cell too. So now it's got to uncoat this. So it's got to release from that capsid. And then we got to start making the new parts for, based on the DNA, RNA of the virus. Got to put those parts together. And then those parts that have been put together to new viruses have to leave the cell. So you have absorption, penetration, uncoating, synthesis, assembly, and then release of it going. So that way you can. Um, release those viruses out so they can go infect other cells. Here's a picture of how it works. So here's the absorption where it's attaching. And in this case, it's an envelope virus. It's being absorbed into it, or penetrating through, and in this case, it's going through uh, endocytosis. Now it uncoats, so it's releasing the genome. You see it right here. Now the genome is going to make new copies of itself. It's going to make copies of its um, capsid and the capsomers. It's going to make copies of the spikes so that way it can reattach. And they'll go to certain spots on this uh, membrane. Then you have to assemble all of this. And then it gets released. And when it releases, it releases to the certain spots where those spikes are. So that way it can pick those spikes up when it leaves. So that way it can go and attach to another cell. <clears throat> Now, just because it's got spikes and can attach to cells doesn't mean it can attach to any cell, right? So they have to come into contact with a susceptible host cell, okay? And if they don't, well, then that virus is not going to do anything to you. Uh, an example would be the uh, canine parvovirus. It has no effect on humans, but it can, it can kill a dog. Uh, now, sometimes they can jump species, kind of like COVID-19 did. It was a bat virus that, uh, through, constant, through enough exposure to it, it jumped the species and it mutated enough 
to uh, infect humans, which is why it's causing problems with this because it's a new virus for us. <clears throat> but they still have to get to specific cells. And that's called a host range. So example, hepatitis B, if it gets under your skin, it's not bothering your skin because it's, it's specific to hepatocytes or liver cells. That's why it's a, uh, so it infects those cells, causes problems there. Polio virus uh, will infect, uh, infect your intestine and your nerves. Uh, so you can, that's why people who have polio usually um, have some kind of nerve damage or are weaker and usually it's a leg. Think of FDR, how it, uh, he was, a big strong man until he got polio and then he lost most of the function of his legs so he was always in a uh, wheelchair or when he did stand up speeches he held on to a podium uh, <clears throat> so he wouldn't fall over rabies has a very large host range because um, they affect virtually every mammal um, and now they do attack uh, nerve cells though okay they don't affect the, if you get, I don't want to say it doesn't affect your skin because, but it, what it does, it, it works its way into your body, into your nervous system. When it gets to the central nervous system, that's where it does its damage. So if you get bit by, say, a rabid dog or a bat or something, usually it's bats anymore, uh, it doesn't mean you're infected right away because you don't, you're not showing any signs or symptoms of it because it hasn't got to your brain and it doesn't move real fast through the bloodstream. It slowly goes, so it can take up to a few weeks. But if you do get bit, you want to get treated quickly just in case because it's uh, it's almost it's a basically it's a hundred percent fatal if you come down with it. There's only been one person in the world that has uh, ever survived rabies without getting the vaccine. Uh, she's still alive. She lives in Minnesota, I believe it is. <clears throat> All right, so that was, again, attaching, absorption, and, and now we're getting into the penetrating, the encoding. Endocytosis is where the entire thing is engulfed. We showed you that in the picture. We'll show you again. Uh, fusion is where an envelope uh, uh, merges with it, and the envelope would stay on the outside, uh, but the rest of the, the capsid and, and nucleic acid will enter the cell. Here's an example. This top one here, this is uh, fusion, it joins and then opens up and just the capsid and the genome gets inside. Endocytosis, the whole thing comes inside, releases the genome. Again, this is endocytosis. The entire uh, virus comes inside and the genome is released. Replicating the produ uh, protein production, so it depends upon whether it's a DNA or an RNA virus. For our purposes, we're going to say if it's a DNA virus, then it's got to get to the nucleus because that's where DNA is, and it'll be um, replicated in the nucleus. An RNA virus would normally be in the cytoplasm because that's where most of our RNA is in the cytoplasm. <clears throat> and again, we then have that positive RNA that, again, it's ready to be translated into a protein and a negative sense needs to be converted into a positive sense before it can be uh, made into a protein. Uh, releasing, uh, budding is kind of like this here, this, this region right here was being pinched off and that virus will release out. Uh, and they're showing you a good example right here, how it buds off. In eukaryotes, they can uh, survive budding for the most part and the cell doesn't necessarily die. Most likely it will die because of the damage caused by the virus on the inside, but they don't right, die right away. <clears throat> Lysis, this is where the cell ruptures and just releases the uh, viruses, the new viruses out into the environment. Uh, in this case, the cell does die, and this is how uh, bacteria are released. They're released through the lysis. <clears throat> Uh, the videos aren't working, so we're going to skip over it. I've got fact checked here. Viruses contain both DNA and RNA, and that is false. They only contain one or the other. Now, before we could see viruses, how did we know a virus is there? Well, <clears throat> we looked into what we call cytopathic effects. Cyto meaning cell, pathic meaning uh, damage or sickness, and the effects of it. 
So they, uh, some of these are similar to each other. So the cells will change size and shape. <clears throat> Sometimes they fuse together and get bigger. Like they're showing right here, this one here is a really large cell as compared to the others. Uh, you get inclusions and these are the uh, little uh, vesicle-like items inside the cells. Now we can see those building up and we can get that. Uh, so the cytoplasmic occlusion include these like two and three here are basically the same. Uh, one and four pretty similar because the cells fuse. So you get this here, the cells are fusing together and you have many nuclei. This is also called syncytia. There's actually a virus is named after this, like respiratory syncytia virus, RSV. Uh, it's not good for uh, babies. Infants, it, it can be damaging to babies. <clears throat> Most uh, adults, it doesn't, it's not going to get us that bad. <clears throat> it can burst the cells, like we said. It can alter DNA. Again, viruses are play a big part in evolution because they do alter DNA. Or they can transform cells into be, uh, to where they become cancerous. We call these oncoviruses then. Uh, so again, that's where the altering of the DNA can come. So just, but just because it altered the DNA does not mean it's going to be a, uh, a cancerous cell. <clears throat> so these are things that we were able to look at before we could actually see a virus with an electron microscope. Again, videos aren't working, so we'll skip it. Here they give you a list of a few viruses and some of their cytopathic effects. Persistent infections. These are ones that are just constantly going and going. Uh, the cells aren't, aren't lice. Again, this is the cells get damaged. We call this, um, again, it lasts a lifetime. It can be like, say, cold sore, lasts a lifetime. These are chronic latent ones. <clears throat> Measles is one we don't normally think about as this way. Uh, it affects children who aren't vaccinated. Uh, for the most part, most, not too many. I mean, there is a mortality rate to it, but it's a very low mortality rate. Um, and most people survive it just fine but it can remain in the brain for a long time. And if it uh, activates again in an adult and causes encephal encephalitis, it has a much higher mortality rate. <clears throat> uh, again, herpes simplex virus, we've talked about, you know, cold sores or even jumbo herpes. Again, they, they reoccur, not on a regular schedule, uh, but they do reoccur. Chicken pox, if you uh, had chicken pox, then you've got the shingles virus. Uh, and the shingles virus can uh, flare up again many decades later, sometimes earlier than that, but many decades later. So these are some ones, these are what we call chronic uh, latent uh, viruses. All right, uh, they go in, they can enter the host cell, inject their in, uh, genome into it, and change the, the genetic material of it. This is the transformation. Uh, <clears throat> it can result in cancer, not always, but it can result in cancer. Uh, some of them do have an increased rate. That, again, these transformed cells, uh, well, cancer cells in this case, uh, do have an increased growth rate. So they grow faster. That's what we call them tumors. Uh, they change the number of chromosomes in them sometimes, and they can keep dividing for a long time. Sometimes they can be uh, what we call immortal cells, where they just keep dividing and keep dividing and keep dividing. So we call these oncoviruses, and they're giving you two examples here. Uh, papilloma virus, which is, causes cervical cancer in women and throat cancer in men. This is uh, HPV. Um, you get, we have vaccines for this now. Um, and then another one is Epstein-Barr, which causes Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, most of you, you've probably heard of Epstein-Barr, just not called that. You've, you've heard of it probably as mono. Uh, that's the same, it's a virus that does this and it can cause a cancer uh, in a lymph, lymph node later on. <clears throat> uh, bacteriophages, now these are the other types of viruses. All right, uh, the most widely studied ones are the ones that affect E. coli. These are your T even viruses, like T2, T4, T6, so forth. They're also called lambda viruses. Uh, similar, the multiplication is very similar to that of the animals. Um, again, there's uh, the nucleic acid enters the cytoplasm, and but there's no encoding because the protein, the capsid itself, does not enter. 
and when these are re, uh, released, it is lysis. They do destroy the cell. Here we go. Absorption again, binding just like on the animal viruses. Penetration, in this case, just the genome enters. On the animal viruses, the entire virus entered. Uh, replication, so you got to start copying everything, the genome, all the capsids, all the proteins to make the tail fibers or the sheath or anything that's going to make the capsid for it. And that's, then you got to assemble all of this. They mature and then they uh, release. And when they release, they lice and uh, then they'll go infect other cells. <clears throat> so here's the cycle. Again, the attachment, the genome getting inside, replicating, uh, starting to assemble all these parts. They're mature, they're ready to leave, and then it lies and they release all those viruses. Uh, here's an example. So you notice it is kind of squeezes down like a hypodermic needle and just the genome gets inside of it, not the proteins. Uh, and there's, here's an E. coli that's burst open and you see all these virus particles leaving. Over here, they're showing you the uh, similarities and differences between bacteriophage replication and animal virus replication. All right, which of the following is not found in animal virus replication? Or excuse me, it's found in animal virus, but not bacteriophage. And since only the genome enters, it is the uncoding portion that is not part of the bacteriophage replication. A couple of side steps on here. Not all of these infections for bacteria are lytic. Sometimes they uh, go into what we call a temperate phase where it'll enter, the, the virus will infect the bacteria, the genome enters it, and it just becomes part of the viral genome. It doesn't do anything. When it does this, we call it a prophage. All right, so it's not, it's not active, it's just, it's just there. <clears throat> Um, as that bacteria replicates, it's going to copy all the genome in there. So it's still going to be copying that viral genome and sending it on with its own progeny. So they call this lysogeny because it's copying the virus and the virus is replicating without actually replicating. Sometimes in it's going to happen. We had they become induced, so they get the induction. This is where something in the environment triggers the genome of the viral, the viral genome to start its process to, to complete the process. Remember, it's already entered, and it's, but it has not replicated anything. And uh, something will induce it. It'll start replicating, and then it'll complete the cycle and lyse the cell and release new progeny out. That's what we're going to look at right here. So again. Virus attaches, injects the genome in, becomes part of the genome. That's this little blue piece, part of the, uh, that's the viral genome. It, it becomes part of it and stays there, stops at that point. This is the prophage. Then if it's induced, it'll continue on with the rest of the cycle. All right, lysogeny uh, will spread the virus without, getting, without killing the cell. Uh, this, just because that genome is there and it's not copying itself, doesn't mean it doesn't have any effect. Uh, it, so it, here's three examples that your uh, textbook gives you. Cornobacterium, or Corinobacterium, uh, diphtheria, Vibrio cholerae, and Clostridium botulinum. If they have uh, the lysogenic conversion, in other words, the uh, virus is in them but it's not replicating, it causes a change in them where they can produce more toxins and become more virulent, uh, more deadly for us. And the bacteria without that viral portion, I mean, they, they do cause problems, but they're nowhere near as virulent. We're much more able to survive them without medicine. <clears throat> All right, how do we cultivate this stuff? Since they have to be in a cell to grow, uh, we have to use cells to grow viruses, to make more of them. Uh, we have a few things. We uh, use cell cultures. Uh, sometimes it's called tissue cultures, where we'll get a Petri dish, and it will have a, just a single layer of cells across it, and we infect them with bacteria, or excuse me, viruses, and we grow the viruses in those cells. We look for those cytopathic effects, the changing of the shape, 
the getting larger, the multinucleation, the syncytium. So this would be what we call in vitro, because in vitro means in a tube without life. So it's just the cells. I don't want to say it's without life, uh, but it's, it's in a tube. It's separate from the organism. Now, the bird embryos and live animal inoculation, these are what we call in vivo. In vivo means you're using an organism. <clears throat> Uh, bird eggs are very good, good for growing this. We have several different areas to grow viruses on these. Um, we make influenza, we make lots of vaccines on bird embryos. Uh, the uh, eggs that have been produced in the springtime, by far the majority of them are going to be used to, not to eat, but to grow uh, viruses so that we can make vaccines for the fall. If they ever come up with the COVID-19 vaccine, most likely it's going to be with a, a bird embryo, with an egg. Uh, live animals are sometimes used, uh, but not very often because they're, it's very expensive to do this and people do get attached to them. An egg, people don't get attached to an egg as easily. All right, so right over here, this is a cell culture or tissue culture. This purplish is a single layer of cells and these white spots are what we call plaques. The plaques are where the cells have died because they've been infected with a virus. So if we're looking for a virus under a microscope with this, look at this under a microscope, we would not look into this purple area because see all those cells look just fine. We would actually look at a plaque and along the edges, like this one right here, there's multiple nuclei inside of this one. So we can see those effects and that's what we would be looking for if we're using a cell or tissue culture. Now on a, a bird embryo and an egg, we have four different regions that we can infect, we can, or should we inject. We can in inoculate the embryo itself. We can inoculate, inoculate the amniotic sac that surrounds the embryo. We can inoculate the yolk sac, or we can inoculate the chorioallantoic membrane. So there's four different regions on an embryo, on an uh, egg, that we can inoculate and we can look for the effects of viruses uh, and when we're growing these things. All right, um, viruses are really important medically because they cause a lot of acute infections. Acute infections means you get sick, then you get over it. All right, you get billions of these things a year. Many people get multiple colds. Colds have been around for a long time with humans, so we don't usually get too sick with it. <clears throat> Influenza goes around lots of times. Some have high mortality rates like Ebola. Um, there's one strain of Ebola that has something like a 90% mortality rate, which is you know almost guaranteed everybody's gonna survive or gonna die. Uh, sometimes these are have chronic infections. We've uh, there's been studies shown that people with type 1 diabetes are infected with a Coxsackie virus. Um, so there's a finding correlation between these, so we don't know if, it's, if the virus is actually causing it, but there, it's more studies that's, uh, and that's coming around to thinking that that's what is happening. And again, we've already said that viruses are everywhere. For like every one organism, there's at least 10 viruses. For every one bacteria cell, there's at least 10 viruses that infect them. So they, they're a major part of the uh, environment. <clears throat> uh, detection and treatment, again, it's more difficult because they're all pretty similar to each other. So you can't go by just a few signs. You gotta get the overall picture. You gotta bring in travel involved with it. That's really, we really see a lot of that with COVID-19. Uh, samples, I mean, it'd be ideal to grow a cell, cell culture, but that takes days sometimes to do this. Uh, then we can screen for parts of the virus. Um, one we're hoping to get going for the COVID-19 is uh, screening for the antibodies. So that means you've had it and then your body has the, produced antibodies and it's, it's either is fighting it or has fought it off. And the reason why is because um, antiviral drugs have a lot of side effects. Because antiviral drugs work in different ways. Uh, some, I can give you an example of Tamiflu, which is one for influenza blocks the it binds to the proteins on the cell the cell the receptors on the cell so that the influenza virus cannot 
attach to the cell, so it can't absorb to it. If it can't attach, it can't get inside, it can't cause you to get sick. So that's one way we can block cells from the viruses from getting into a cell. Another way is we can uh, stop a virus from uh, uncoding or you know, uh, getting the release in the genome, or we can stop it from replicating. But if we stop it from replicating, we're stopping basically either DNA or RNA from replicating, and we need that ourselves. So it's a double-edged sword on that one. Uh, we can try to stop it from reforming, or we can try to stop it from leaving the cell. Those are ways to do it. Um, it sounds fairly simple, but it's much, much more complicated than I'm making it out to be. But I'm just giving you the very briefest descriptions of these things. So yes, antiviral drugs cause lots of side effects because of how they affect you. And you normally have to take two or three different ones to get the full effect of it and to help prevent everything. We call them cocktails. All right, there's a few other things out there besides that we throw in with viruses because we don't know where else to put them. Uh, one of these things are called prions. Uh, prions are misfolded proteins. All right? There's no nucleic acid. There's no DNA or RNA. Uh, these things are very resistant to sterilization, and they cause what we call spongiform encephalopathies. Dang, I'm having a hard time there. And this is, like it says, a neuro, fatal neurodegenerative disease. It can be in you for decades. Once you start showing symptoms, you've got about a year to survive. All right? <clears throat> There's no cure, no treatment, or anything for this. All right, some common ones are uh, scrapie that was found in sheep and goats. And then the... Unfortunately, this jumped the species to cows, and we call it bovine uh, spongiform encephalopathy, encephalopathies, also known as mad cow disease. Then that one actually jumped the species over to humans, and there was like 176 humans that were infected in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s from this. Um, and now there's a possibility that others have been affected. We just don't know yet because, again, they can lie dormant for decades before it finally shows up. Uh, one that's found in deer is called uh, wasting disease, also known as chronic wasting disease. Uh, and then there's a human version that we've known about for a long time. It's called creutzfeldt jakob syndrome. Uh, the uh, mad cow disease that has jumped species to humans, we call that one a variant creutzfeldt jakob syndrome. <clears throat> and again, it's a misfolded protein, and they're showing you here with these uh, pink ones. The misfolded proteins come in, they come in contact with the normal folded, folded proteins, and it causes them to misshape. Um, what, proteins have a specific shape because they have a specific function. When they change shape, they don't function properly or they don't function at all. And this builds up. And when you, you, you can only check this out on somebody who's a post-mortem. So that's because you look at the brain and it'll look like there's holes like a sponge. That's, and they, that's why it's get called the spongiform. So that's prions. Other things are called satellite viruses. And these satellite viruses are the viruses of viruses. The easy way to put it. So the adeno-associated virus is a virus that replicates only in cells that have already been infected with a specific type of an adenovirus. Uh, your textbook here calls it a delta agent, but uh, I learned it as hepatitis D. Uh, hepatitis D, again, is a RNA virus that only infects uh, cells that have been infected with hepatitis B. Uh, luckily, we have hepatitis B vaccines. So if you get vaccinated for hepatitis B, you cannot get hepatitis D. Um, hepatitis B is known to cause cancer um, and liver cancer, about that. And in, I believe in mo by far the majority of the cases where the hepatitis B has caused cancer, hepatitis D is present also. <clears throat> And then there's another type here called a viroid. And this is just a piece of RNA. So it doesn't have the protein coat like a virus does. So it's not a virus. That's why we call it a viroid. Anytime you see oid, it means it's like something. So it's like a virus. 
but these have only been in, uh, identified in plants. All right, exposure to nucleases to degrade DNA and RNA would damage all but the following. So which ones do not have any kind of nucleic acid? And that would be the prions. There's no nucleic acid, so uh, a nucleus would not affect it at all. That is the end of this unit. It's a little bit longer than normally do. I apologize for that. Um, but good luck. Again, email me if you have any questions. Bye-bye.